Hello and welcome to Newswire. I'm Aiza Umar and you're watching a new episode of Newswire. Today we'll be discussing the trip that the U.S. Special Envoy to Afghanistan, which is Zalmi Khalilzad, and the chief negotiator, as he is, he was also this time accompanied by the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for South and Central Asia, Malaysia, Ms. Alice Wells. They're right now in Islamabad. The delegation-level talks are taking place between uh, Pakistan and the U.S. And they are discussing in the Foreign Office various topics, and on top of that are not just the bilateral relationship between the two, but also peace and reconciliation in Afghanistan. Now, Khalil Zad has appreciated Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan's statement earlier, which said basically that his appeal for reduction of violence and policy against promoting internal conflict in other nations has the potential, essentially, to positively transform this region and also give Pakistan a leading role. Of course, here he is strongly referring to Afghanistan. Meanwhile, a damning report by the UN reveals that more Afghan civilians have been killed by the coalition forces in Afghanistan than by Taliban or any other terrorist group, in fact, in the first quarter of 2019. Now, intra-Afghan dialogue is key, and Taliban's agreement to holding a ceasefire is also paramount to success of the talks. But after the collapse of last round of talks, which ended before they could even start, how far will Zalmay's latest effort go in bringing the Taliban face to face with the Ghani government? And to talk about this and more, let me introduce our guest today. We a, a Afghan journalist, Mr. Intizar Khadim, who has joined us in our Istanbul studios. Welcome to Newswire. And also we have from Istanbul uh, joining us a political analyst, Ms. Tania Gudsuzian. So good to have both of you here. I'll start with you, um, Mr. Khadim. If you were to comment on uh, what is happening in the Foreign Office uh, between Washington and Islamabad, of course, Afghanistan is on top of the agenda. What is your perception of this discussion? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think the Afghan peace has been the uh, high priority issues for the United States, uh, specifically for Khalil Zad. He has been a special envoy to Donald Trump, and he would like to translate the South Asia strategy of uh, Donald Trump to Afghanistan in the, re the region. Uh, with that, I think the Afghan peace is now uh, uh, one of the immediate issue. Uh, Khalil Zad is the perfect person, and, and he's just traveling around. He just he's, has been very vocal. He have defined the uh, peace in, in reconciliation process to all the stakeholders, uh, and, and he's, he's very good. Also, uh, defining the rule of the original countries, including Pakistan. Uh, his recent uh, trip to, to, to Moscow uh, has also been uh, one of the, uh, uh, the message that can give hopes to, to, to the Afghan people and to all the side that suffers directly or indirectly the, the peace talk. Uh, for that, I think uh, today's visit of Khalilzad to Pakistan, I think that can uh, further elaborate uh, and that can break down uh, what Pakistan can do in, in how the promises of Pakistan can, can, can come to, to the reality. Uh, uh, so with that, uh, I think I'm happy, I'm optimistic. Uh, I see the peace process very complicated. It's tedious, it's long standing. We should not be uh, hoping that things will happen overnight, but mm -hmm. such kind of trips and in, in dialogues and in, in efforts will ultimately bring peace to Afghanistan in the region. Right. Ms. Tania, do you feel like he, Zalmir Khalilzad has come a long way in now appreciating Pakistan's role, saying it is key in regional peace, considering how it started off, uh, not just with an ultimatum to the Taliban, to uh, toe the line as these peace talks uh, started last year, but also uh, a bit on the cold side towards Pakistan back then? I think, uh, I mean, that's a good question, but let's also take a step back and look at what's happening in Kabul today. Um, very significant is the fact that uh, President Ashraf Hani is holding a consultative lawyer, Jirga. Um, this comes after much criticism, both from uh, Zalmay Khalilzad and the Taliban, that there is no um, Afghan uh, national consensus on how to move forward in bringing peace to the country. Um, as a result of which uh, the Afghan government has largely been excluded from that process. Um, so you got 3,000 uh, delegates coming together in Kabul from 34 provinces, representing essentially the 31 million people of Afghanistan. Um, this is an important development because this will put an end to that criticism that there is no Afghan national consensus um, for which the Afghan government can speak. And many, many people have expressed uh, concern that there would be no binding peace without the contribution of the Afghan, without the participation of the Afghan government. 
but the criticism that Mr. Zalbi Khalilzad and the Taliban have for the lawyer Jirka and other critics saying that it is just a rubber stamp way for the government to justify their position and their existence. Uh, Mr. Khadim, how do you see this lawyer just uh, taking place today in Afghanistan? Uh, <clears throat> well, I, I have been uh, very vocal uh, on this, the uh, modality of the slow jarga from the onset of uh, uh, the Afghan government uh, plan that they have to be convening such low jarga or, or such low consultative jarga for peace. Uh, last night I had two interviews on uh, such topic and I said that there has been three or four outcomes that I predict. Number one, uh, this jarga is expected by the unity government that they have to be uh, conceding President Ghani's uh, leadership and ruling power until the election happens. And it's obviously postponed uh, for about six months. We do not know how long that will be, but for the time being, uh, it has been postponed. The High Court of Afghanistan already uh, uh, justified that President Ghani will be ruling the country. Uh, well, for the time being, if, if we just uh, act between bad and worse, I think President Ghani should stay in the position. Uh, but Loya Jarga, consultative Loya Jarga, which is very historic in for thousands and thousands of years that remain in the history of Afghanistan, should not be using uh, this name in this title um, for, the, for ensuring the, the, the self-interest. Second is the, the lawyer Jarga is expected that they should, they should call upon the Taliban that they have to be sitting directly face to face with, with the Afghan government. Well, they do not uh, because they have their own reasons. Uh, instead of, of putting all these nation or maybe 3,000 people in a consultative lawyer Jarga to call upon the Taliban, I think this is important for the Afghan government as well to make proper arrangement within the government to ensure Taliban are, has been convinced, the international com community has been convinced, and finally Taliban come, can come to the table in, uh, in talk with the Afghan government. See, uh, for the time being there is a political ramification, I call it. There is political fracture. Uh, the political opposition now in Afghanistan is not attending uh, this lawyer jarga, even Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, who is the uh, executive officer, uh, mm. uh, or maybe a 50% power holder of mm -hmm. the unity government. He's also boycotted. I mean, President Karzai, uh, he also boycotted this lawyer jarga and a number of other uh, very prominent uh, politicians boycotted. I mean, I would have been suggesting the Afghan government that they would have been doing all these consultation and this jarga should have been putative, should mm -hmm. have been consensus oriented rather than to be only a jarga for the sake of jarga. Right, but when you see the important political leadership by courting it, doesn't it make you worry that the very spirit of the lawyer Jirka has been lost? <clears throat> well, that's true. That's true. Uh, if there is no consensus-oriented approach where every person will see themselves in that matter, I'm not sure if this consultative lawyer Jirka will be having a legitimate impact on a number of national level uh, overriding directives or maybe processes. What I really concern, I'm really concerned about is the uh, elongation or maybe procrastination of the peace process. This is an immediate problem. Uh, every day in Afghanistan, 200 soldiers are losing their life in that last cause. Instead of putting all these efforts to ensure that someone is staying on the, on the seat, it's better this ruling uh, state and also the political opposition, including uh, the prominent nation of Afghanistan, should sit together and find a type of recipe that that's just will put an, a period to all these uh, bloodshed in, in, in killing tit for tat. From one side, Taliban are losing life. From the other side, the Afghan soldiers are losing life. We, as ordinary Afghans, are just living in fear and waiting for death. That's not a standard life. That's why this Louis Jirga should have been postponed for at least when the Afghan government, the Americans and the Taliban would have been sit on a table, if they would have been inking any type of mm -hmm. agreements, this lawyer general should have been putting a stamp of approval on that. Or right. maybe this lawyer general should have happened maybe six months ago. Right. So they would have been mapping out I'm how I'm glad the you mentioned that because that was my question. Ms. Tanya, let me ask you this. Why now is the lawyer general being called? I mean, the last one was during Karzai's tenure in 2013. Uh, this could have been done earlier. Why did he take this opportunity, this time, to call the lawyer Jirka? Uh, let me begin by first saying I'm not entirely sure I agree with Mr. Intizar. Um, it is true that the lawyer Jirga is um, a centuries-old um, Afghan democratic method of dealing with 
um, such crises or, or decision making. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think it's important to point out the fact that it is not um, possible to manipulate the outcome of a consultative loya jirga. Back in 2013, when former President Hamid Karzai held the Loya Jirga, I believe that was to determine uh, whether or not the people were for or against the signing of the bilateral security agreement. Uh, I believe that uh, President Karzai had hoped people would oppose it. But in fact, the Loya Jirga uh, was very much in support of that agreement. So um, President Ghani holding this consultative Loya Jirga um, is um, very much is his prerogative as the elected president of his country. Um, and um, let's not diminish what 3,000 delegates means, 28% of which are women. Um, the um, delegates also comprise uh, the families of martyrs. Uh, there are um, among them also um, most of the tribes represented um, and many young people who have a stake in the future of Afghanistan. So let's not diminish what the Loya Jirga means. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, and even though um, it's not necessarily going to issue a decision, um, the fact that uh, 3,000 people coming together um, and giving the president a sense of what the will of the Afghan people is, is critical because this is something that um, that he can then um, say, uh, well, look, I'm not coming to the table empty handed. I'm bringing, I represent the will of the Afghan people. Especially considering that the uh from the Taliban is, is essentially been that the government, uh, the current government is a, a U.S. stooge and they refuse to speak to them. Uh, at the same time, now that he is calling this lawyer jerk, and like you said, it's not easy to manipulate the outcome of 3,000 delegates. How do you interpret Taliban's criticism of uh, holding this lawyer jerk? Well, the Taliban, uh, that has been their position um, since the very beginning, that they do not want to negotiate with the Afghan government because they consider it a U.S. stooge. Um, but they can they can say whatever they like. This is the elected Afghan government, and um, they have to be included in these talks. Um, no peace talk can be um, productive without the participation of the Afghan government. Um, a couple of weeks ago, um, they found um, they found problems with the 250-member delegation that was supposed to come to Doha. Today, they're finding a problem with the lawyer Jirga. I don't think the Afghan government can do anything uh, that's going to um, that's going to change the Taliban's uh, mind on this issue. But it doesn't change the fact that the Afghan government must be included in these negotiations. Mr. Khadim, how do you this criticism of the Taliban against the lawyer Jirka? And also on that note, uh, the 250 member guest list over which essentially the last round of talks collapsed. Uh, how, how do you see that? Well, <clears throat> before coming to that part, let me have a minor correction uh, into the word of lawyer Jirka. It's not lawyer Jirka. It's, it's a consultative lawyer Jirka. Uh, because um, uh, Chapter 6 of the Afghan Constitution, Article 111, uh, have clarity on that. And uh, in, in that's a different formation, and that's a different juncture of the, uh, the parliament in the Senate and then the uh, representative of districts and provinces and all these kind of things. So, so I will not just drill down over that. That's why we have to be using uh, the word of uh, consultative lawyer jirga, which is not lawyer jirga, because lawyer jirga have imposing power. That's constitutionally stipulated. Uh, and also, the president cannot uh, deny whatever the decision has been made by Loya Jirga. But this consultative Loya Jirga is not Loya Jirga of the Constitution. For example, if any decision come out of this consultative Loya Jirga, the Afghan government and the unity government is not uh, is responsible to, to apply that decision not of the Loya Jirga because it's not, not, not constitutionally uh, written. Uh, 2, I, let, me years see, ago, let me let me just uh, quickly get Miss Tanya. I see you don't uh, you want to add something to this, Miss Tanya? No, but this is precisely what I said. I said let's keep in mind the fact that this is a consultative lawyer jirga. This is not going to issue a binding decision. What it's going to do is give the Afghan president the ability to turn around and say, "I have consensus. I have a national consensus, and this is what the Afghan people want." And it may not necessarily be what he wants. Because, as we said earlier, we can't manipulate the outcome of a consultative lawyer, Jirka. Right. So we're on the same page of this. But, Mr. Khadim, yes. what is the point of this uh, consult uh, lawyer, Jirga, when it, uh, the government is not bound by uh, the decisions or the outcome of it? Uh, 
Well, let me tell you one more thing. Um, <clears throat> this lawyer jerga, or maybe this lawyer consultative lawyer jerga, is is uh, is is happening in the very uh, sensitive uh, time of of the history of Afghanistan. I'm the future of Afghanistan, and I'm just a person who has been scorched in the war of Afghanistan. In I just uh, uh, attentively, attentively uh, watching everything that's happening in Afghanistan, including this lawyer Jirga. I understand how these uh, people just came from different provinces and just today are participating. I'm not, not sure if Ms. Sanya understands the recent updates from the lawyer Jirga that's what's happening there. I'm the person who understands whether it's a, it's a bungling structure or juncture of all these participants or just a so-called politicized uh, gathering or maybe it's uh, something uh, made unbiased and impartial. Anyway, uh, this consultative lawyer jirga is a jirga that I do not deny it uh, ultimately, but I say that it should have been made differently. Now, whatever the decision come out, that I hope that will impact on the mentality of the Taliban and also the mentality of the political opposition, which I doubt it will happen because the political opposition is already cleared their stances. The Taliban already cleared their stances. It doesn't mean that the Taliban, if Taliban say we do not talk with the Afghan government, and we say that's correct. Mm -hmm. I have been a person for the last six months that I am just calling on Taliban that they have to be sitting sooner or later with the Afghan right. government. But they continue but to criticize the government not, should not be bilateral. To sit down with this them. should not be the government Taliban talk. It should be the Afghan nation plus Taliban talk. But how do you represent the Afghan nation if it's not even a proper lawyer jirga? Well, let's divide the Afghan nation by three parts. <clears throat> Number one, the Afghan ruling country or the ruling structure, which is the national unity government. Second is the political oppositions. Third is the ordinary citizens or nation, which include the civil society, the media, the ulama, the businessmen. Mm -hmm. You may have heard and watched very carefully that how 250 participant list of the Qatar conference has been made. Well, on the day of, of that trip to Qatar, it has been a very chaotic situation in Afghanistan. And as, as, you, as you know, the Taliban called it like a wedding party. Right. And I was thinking the same, like it was like a party of a wedding in the village. Okay. It was unorganized. So now I call that if Taliban would like to talk with the Afghan government, that should, not, that should not be only government, but that also should be political opposition in the Afghan nation. Okay, so we are now just joined Mr. Rustam Shah Mohammad. He is the former ambassador uh, uh, to uh, Pakistan of, from Afghanistan. Thank you for joining us here. Mr. Uh, Rustam Shah, how do you see this development of the lawyer jirga, even if it is a consultative uh, lawyer jirga, and uh, seeing, uh, as analysts are calling this, a, a, a last attempt by President Ghani to rubber stamp his existence, his position in uh, the peace dialogue? Well, firstly, the lawyer jirga has been a, a long, centuries-old tradition in Afghanistan. Whenever the country is confronted with a big uh, situation, big problem, and they want to seek a solution that reflects the aspirations of the people, the lawyer jirga has occurred. The point is, how is the composition, what is the composition of the lawyer jirga? Have those people been called who have independent opinion? Are the ones who generally support the government? Are those who somehow are connected directly or indirectly with the government institution? So it really depends. If Mr. Ashrafani wants to have a lawyer jirga that would endorse his policy, which is that the Taliban should come and join an elected government, there is a parliament, there is a constitution, they have an elected government, and they should just come and join. Well, that is never going to happen. Okay. Uh, if that were to happen, that would have happened 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So I don't think uh, that is a very uh, valid argument to advance in these circumstances, mm -hmm. because now the insurgency is the 17th or 18th year, and they are controlling more areas than ever before in the last 16, 17 years. Mm -hmm. And they are ascendant force now. They are entering into new areas. They are collecting taxes. They have their own courts, etc., etc. So I think this is a very complex situation. What needs to happen, in my view, is that the Loi Jirga may, may give perhaps a split verdict. And that would further uh, make the confusion worse than pounded. The point is that 
uh, we have to have a, an arrangement where there is an interim government of which the Taliban are a part, and that interim government has a mandate, a duration, a leadership, and uh, very clearly laid out a program of how to transfer power to the next government in two years, one and a half years, two and a half years, whatever. So I think that is the only, uh, in my view, select road map. But the hurdles are, number one, whether the Taliban would agree to a ceasefire, and right. number two, whether the time frame for withdrawal, because Taliban are insisting on six to seven, nine months, the Americans are talking about three years. And number three, whether and on what conditions the Taliban would like to be maintained. I think the Taliban also are to blame partly because they have to now convert their movement into a political party. Uh, of which there okay. is manifesto, okay. there is a leadership, there is a hierarchy, and the government also have to show flexibility. And I think this the is, Americans have to, right. have to bring pressure to bear on the government to show more flexibility. To do more. Okay, so, so hold that thought. Let me come to you. Last question to you, Mr. Zizar Khadim. This concern is something that Zalmi Khalil Saad just in, uh, on Sunday uh, during an interview to Tolo News has highlighted as well that ceasefire is... A, a important, a key a factor that plays in in order for this peace process to succeed. Do you think the Taliban will respect this or take this as an ultimatum? Well, Taliban do not have any choice. Uh, so far, the uh, current government, whether it's national unity government or it's a, it's a made by deal or made by the uh, vote of the Afghan people, still it's ruling. Uh, the Taliban leadership, I expect them that they should be softened their stances. Uh, they should not be just staying on their own position and in, in stay for 100 years. Uh, I hope that after 18 years, uh, both the Afghan government and also the Taliban leadership and everybody engaged directly or indirectly in the Afghan process should be thinking differently because uh, this peace process, which is happening right now, needs specific fixes. It, it has a serious shortcomings, and that belong back on, on the leadership of the both sides. Mm -hmm. I, I neither uh, uh, sometime uh, uh, support the stance of the Afghan government, neither the Taliban uh, leadership side. So I, I hope that both sides will think differently. They have to be sitting with each other, uh, right. use some logics. Uh, this dialogue between the Taliban and the Afghan government or the Afghan nation should be composed of the Afghan elites, uh, youngsters, uh, media, civil society, ulama in the Afghan government in political opposition. I mean, that will represent the entire society because that should not be only a politicized deal where the some few individual, low scarred individual from the Afghan government will be talking with the, with the Taliban and they will be presenting their own cases. So if this is a national type delegation and a presentation, so Taliban will be convinced because they will be called by all side of the Afghan government and hopefully peace will come. One last word, mm -hmm. peace is now the imminent and one of the inevitable uh, thing that will happen in Afghanistan. If we do some political uh, uh, mistakes, peace deal will be not in a way, ideal way that we would like. It could right. be a little bit costly. Some human rights will just pay unbe unbearable price. Yes. But at ultimately, peace will come. So peace will come. every so side, you're the Afghan that government, on Taliban, the, right the region, and the international community should be coming to one page, and hopefully that peace will come to Afghanistan. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Azar Khadim, for your wonderful insight there. Now, coming to you, Ms. Tania, I can't help but highlight here that how the conversation over the past weeks, over the past months, seems to be going in a circuitous, vicious cycle almost. Every time there's a build-up of some milestones, some success, there's a breakdown because there seems to be a lot of mistrust from all sides. How do you see this? Are you seeing as much hope as Mr. Khadim seems to see in this process? Well, there is no doubt that every Afghan wants peace, uh, whatever their ideological inclinations, whatever their ethnicity, whatever their religion. Frankly, um, this has gone on uh, long enough but emotions are running very, very high, and this is a very divisive moment. Um, whoever you speak to has very, very strong opinions. Um, and I, I, I feel for our, our fellow panelist who, as he said, he is the future of Afghanistan and he's got to live with uh, whatever is determined in these talks. And this is, this is quite important to point out. 
Um, I am hopeful that the Afghan will and um, desire for peace will prevail at the end. And um, we the will concerns see... Are, the concerns are not just with critics and analysts. It's not just from the third parties. Zalmi Khalilzad said also again in this interview that it's not most likely that there will be a complete ceasefire, that there will be a significant uh, reduction of violence in Afghan after uh, the peace agreement. Doesn't that worry you, considering how over a... a a list of 250 delegates, an entire talk collapsed before it started. So uh, it seems as if uh, there is a lot, not just mistrust, but it's a very sensitive issue. It is a sensitive issue. And as um, Zalmay Khalilzad said, um, ceasefire has to be a, a precondition uh, to peace, uh, frankly. But there's also something to point out is the fact that the Taliban is not the only armed group operating in the country. There are other armed groups. So it's not necessarily the case that peace will follow um, some agreement with the Taliban. All right. Thank you, Sir Vistania. And uh, also, Mr. Intazar Khadem, and Mr. Rustam Shah Mohammed for joining us here for this part of Newswire. We will take a quick short break and after that we'll be back with the next story. Welcome back. You're watching Newswire. Now, Sri Lanka continues to reel from the eight bomb blasts that ripped through churches holding Easter services and also ripped through high-end hotels on the 21st of April this year. Over 250 people were killed and more than 500 were injured. ISIS came forth and took responsibility, albeit without providing evidence. Sri Lankan government admitted serious security lapses and Sri Lankan Defence Secretary resigned. Sri Lankan President Matrepala Sirisena announced a ban on face covering, an action taken essentially to prevent impediments in face identification during security details. Meanwhile, Muslims are rushing out of Nikambo and Colombo in fear of sectarian violence and attacks on them. A local extremist group called the National Tawhi Jamaat has also come into the spotlight with its connection to being behind the attacks. Now, the group is an associated arm of the Indian Tamil Nadu Tawhi Jamaat. What is being questioned by some critics right now at this time is why and who would want to have done this and why in Sri Lanka? Some of the answers are pointing towards India's premier intelligence agency, Raw. But can that be justified? Has that once very popular Indra doctrine got anything to do with it? Is this a revival of that doctrine? To find out more and to expand on this issue, we are joined by Ms. Chandni Kirinde, journalist from Colombo. Also, we have a parliamentarian who's joining us also from Colombo, Mr. D.V. Chanaka, and Lieutenant General Naeem Khalid Lodi, a former defense secretary, joining us from Islamabad. Thank you so much for joining us here. Uh, at Newswire, it's just been a week and, of course, the aftershocks of this event of what has happened in Sri Lanka continue. In fact, just uh, recently, a development has taken place where a security raid has uh, taken place. And Ms. Chandni, if you could tell us a little more about what has just happened. Uh, well, uh, since uh, last Sunday, there have been a spate of uh, raids carried out by the uh, army because the, now the army has been given special powers under emergency regulations. So, a lot of the operations have been concentrated uh, in the eastern uh, district of Batikaloa and particularly a few towns which are predominantly Muslim. Mm -hmm. And most of the arrests so far have been from those areas where they've uh, found quite a lot of calls of weapons and, uh, you know, the, of course, the ISIS banner which they found then as well as, you know, all kinds of, uh, you know, die, all kinds of ammunition. Mm -hmm. So most of the uh, operations were concentrated there, but then all across the island, they have stepped up uh, search operations. They are going from house to house. Uh, so there is a very high state of uh, uh, security, heightened state all over the country. But mm -hmm. I think it's a, work since, a week since the uh, incident, so... People are also, starting from today, most people are going back to work. But also, uh, Ms. Chandni, the President Sirisina's latest announcement that's just come today that the face will of any sort that may, becomes an impediment in face recognition, identification will be banned. Is this, uh, how is it being perceived in Sri Lanka at this time where Muslims are already worried about their safety? Uh, yes, yes, the, it, yes, the announcement came last night. 
and uh, the, the, we are i mean most uh, muslim politicians at least have uh, said they would support the ban given the uh, seriousness of the situation so we haven't seen anyone objecting to it uh, so far but uh, there are two schools of thought there are people who think you know covering the face could be a hindrance to investigations and security at this moment there are some people who feel it's not a good idea it's a bit of a sensitive issue mm-hmm. and it's cropped up in sri lanka even before this incident happened but mm-hmm. no one was because given the sensitivity of the issue uh, it was pretty much in the background and no one wanted to really tackle it but now given in the light of these attacks there seems to be a growing call to uh, you know stop the at least the full face cover veil uh, right. being worn by the muslim women but then also i have to tell you that there aren't a, there is a big, uh, out of uh, the muslim women i think the percentage of women who actually wear that is rather low in this country most women just wear the there's rather low in that country yeah. also there has been it has always been known that in sri lanka the diversity that is with the buddhists the muslims and the christians they have always historically mostly get, gotten along but here in general let me ask you this uh, if we'll comment on if you were to comment on the involvement that critics are now pointing out and analysts are looking towards draw on having had something to do with zahran hashim the alleged mastermind who traveled to india 3 months back prior to this attack what would you say I think the first thing, uh, first of all, very sad events, and we stand by our uh, Sri Lankan brothers and sisters that this are, and I think government has also offered all sort of help, whether intelligence sharing or whatever they want. It is up their choice. Now, the one or two points which I want to make, uh, of course, uh, Indian raw and uh, uh, the government has been uh, very badly exposed as far as the, this event is concerned. But I would hastily like to add that uh, a Muslim name. Uh, does not really uh, necessarily mean that uh, the perpetrator is a muslim uh, because according to our faith anyone who carries out a terrorist attack uh, whether a muslim man or a woman cannot be a muslim uh, islam means peace and we we all know that now if we look at the larger picture uh, we know that uh, uh, india is trying to acquire the status of a regional policeman and we also know that uh, why they are doing it they have uh, you know uh, some understanding with the super power and there are number of uh, uh, you know understanding them who use uh, with them uh, on intelligence sharing on logistics and uh, you also know that a new command has come up known as the indo pacific command so if you look at the bigger picture and uh, also uh, the relationship between china and uh, sri lanka that was improving so i think the thing things become quite clear that india is under pressure to prove her worth that she can be a policeman of this area and she tried uh, you know after pulwama attack on pakistan got a bloody nose and now they have uh, tried this and maybe they will be trying more things but i think ultimately it will become very clear to the world and uh, to uh, to those powers who think that uh, uh, they can bank on india uh, they, it will be very clear that india is not up to that uh, they do not have the prowess to really uh, become a policeman of this area and just look at them they they have the, the strained relation with all their neighbors all around china uh, pakistan sri lanka even bhutan and nepal uh, so with this sort of attitude i do not know how they can continue living as a peaceful and such a great uh, democracy if, if one were to go by your argument if you just expand a little on your argument here it, it's also that india is a massive democracy with a completely different scale of economy and development as compared to an island nation like lanka what possible threat could it have anything to do with china's uh, relations with sri lanka or pakistan's relations with sri lanka uh you know then i must get back to the uh, the thing which i alluded earlier but because there is an understanding between united states and india uh to to give uh, give india the hegemonic role of this region and they they are they are just trying to assert themselves in that direction but i am sure what you are hinting at i i, I agree with that that ultimately uh, such a huge democracy with the growing economy why should they harm themselves unnecessarily by uh aligning themselves with a power which is asking them to do things uh, which are not within their province mr chandni how do you see this perception about sri lanka and india's role uh, in the possible sort of uh, policing the region 
Yeah, as of now, the, oh, the government has maintained that they have, there is no foreign involvement in these attacks. But of course, we have uh, re- heard, seen many reports of even published in the Indian media and in other countries that some of the, yeah, the one of the terrorists involved had uh, traveled to Kerala in South India mm-hmm. uh, a few times. And of course, uh, I think the Indian media also reported that there are two uh, terrorist groups or at least two extremist groups in the south of India, in Tamil Nadu and this area, which they believe may have had links with these. So at the moment, the government does not say there is complicity between right. They're being cautious of we... how they label this. So we have Mr. D.V. Chanaka with us. Mr. Chanaka, how do you see this uh, perception that India is trying to police the region and hence might have something to do with it? Also considering earlier media reports that the Indian High Commission and agencies knew everything uh, about the attack 20 days prior to it taking place. Uh, uh, actually, India been informed us. At least they were there in Sri Lanka, and at least till that, even Sri Lanka intelligence didn't know about this. At least because of them, they have informed us. But our intelligence or our police didn't take it serious. Even our government didn't take this serious. That's why this attack been held because you know uh, the people who's behind this attack organization. Everything, everything been informed, but this government didn't take it serious because of that. Even the prime ministers clearly said he knew there are IS people who trained in Syria came back to country, but we didn't have from we like when Sri Lankan government wanted to the postpone the election within one day they can make the law, but when they need to address the IS guy, they didn't any proper laws. Is Sri Lankan government is behind this and Sri Lankan government is weak on our intelligence because we were under the terrorist attack for 30 years. We were under, under the war 30 years. After the 30 years time, after the war, we came back to this peace for 10 years. For that 10 years, government didn't worry about national security. That's why we are here right now. Now, because of this, economy is crashed. Uh, tourism is crashed, everything going back to the days like tw- before 2009. Mm-hmm. Because of these issues, okay. now government should take the full responsibility of this. But that is something now. that the government is doing. Uh, Lieutenant General uh, Naib Khaled, what is your take on how uh, our guest, uh, the parliamentarian from Colombo, is uh, seeing this? It seems almost as if the government is being very cautious in responding uh, to any kinds of allegations that this might be a foreign involvement? I mean, it is quite understandable um, for a country like Sri Lanka that it is very difficult to blame such a big neighbor uh, next door. Uh, But one, uh, we must look at the history that who was uh, supporting uh, Tamil Tigers operations against the Sri Lankan government. I mean, everybody knows the answer all right. And then uh, who said that uh, we are in competition with uh, China and Russia and we will uh, try to uh, stop their uh, economic and political expansion. Some country has said it very openly. Then which country has got uh, clear cut uh, understanding in written form, uh, proper uh, pacts uh, regarding logistics and regarding intelligence sharing and all those things. And another thing which uh, comes to one mind, uh, one's mind that logically, why should a Muslim uh, do a thing which creates problems for the Muslims of, uh, in this country. I mean, if, if, if you and me, uh, and anyone who wants to do something good to our right. community, so then will then what is, do, what is, what is your reaction to the narrative that is being used that this is a avenging the New Zealand Christchurch attack? Uh, I don't contribute to that because uh, that, that, is a, that would be a far-flung uh, idea. I think uh, New Zealand government and the people of New Zealand responded so well uh, after that incident that uh, I don't think there were any fissures created or any uh, d- deeper bitterness uh, created as far as the Muslims are concerned. Actually, Muslims all over the world, they appreciated the way uh, the New Zealand things were handled. And if there were any apprehensions initially, they were all allayed and uh, people felt very good. And there was a sort of harmony seen between various faiths. And I think uh, faiths of all people, they have come forward and they have 
said that anybody who carries out a terrorist attack is, uh, is, uh, is a non-religious or it has nothing to do with any religion because no religion professes uh, the, these sort of activities and uh, not especially Islam. So I don't think it can be a reaction to that. I don't take that. You don't take that. But then how do you respond to the media reports, not just from uh, around the region, but especially out of India, that Indian High Commission and agencies knew about this attack. They uh, had only warned the Sri Lankan government an hour or two hours before it actually happened. You know, this is a post-truth era and, uh, you know, great buildings of falsehood are built on uh, grounds which are not there altogether. And then we are also aware of the term as false flag operation, that you try to create an impression. Uh, why did they just inform them two hours earlier? I mean, uh, I don't think that uh, if, if they had any information, it could have been with them uh, weeks ago. Uh, it is very difficult to... So I, I, I think this was all done in a way so that they think that uh, India is a sympathizer and they have nothing to do with it. Uh, whereas if they knew all this, so they, 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 are, they, they are a great country, they would have made sure that this doesn't happen. And then maligning the Muslims, which is a continuation of uh, you know, the narrative which is being perpetrated by Indians and some other uh, vested interests. So I think this is uh, you know, ju just, just such a confusion of uh, falsehood and truth and mixing up of things that uh, I think the leadership, the Sri Lankan leadership will have to very coolly analyze all factors, uh, the history, uh, the known facts of collaboration between parts and uh, uh, the policeman role which is uh, being given and all these things I think so, if uh, put on table uh, things become very clear. But, right, so Mr. Janak, another we are you back on the line, you don't see the connection of uh, the relationship between uh, Sri Lanka and China and how it could possibly be a bone of contention or, or a threat to India's well-being or even U.S.'s for that matter, since, since they're both on the same page here. But it could be a threat to the America or the India, but the issue here, I see this is attack being done by the ISIS. As I know, it has nothing to do with India because Whatever I see here is India been informed us 4th of April and we had 70, 17 days to do, do take necessary actions, but our government didn't take that responsibility. But they have informed us. There were earlier reports also that were laid on, refuted by the U.S. ambassador in Sri Lanka. There were earlier uh, misinformation was spread as this attack took place that the U.S. knew about and conveyed it to Sri Lanka. That again was refuted that no such thing happened. Similarly with India, that India knew earlier, but this was not refuted, that India knew weeks before and only informed two hours prior. Uh, actually, uh, even the like Sri Lankan deputy minister, he said even America knew about it. But the American embassy did say she didn't know anything and she didn't inform anything to Sri Lanka. But I don't know which one is lying with the Sri Lanka minister or the American ambassador. Whatever I see here mm -hmm. is the information was there all the time. Because I know this is not being, at, this is organized, well, very well organized attack. Mm -hmm. This has been there for years, for sure, like whatever the information we have right now, we can see they've been targeting this for years and they've been organized for years. But even the Sri Lankan intelligence, they have informed Security Council more than 47 times there are IAs at some time they are going to attack. And this is happening in Sri Lanka. Mr. D.V. Chanaka, thank you so much for joining us here on Newswire. Also, Ms. Chandni and Lieutenant General uh, Lodi, thank you for giving us your time and your insight to Newswire. This is unfortunately the end of the program now, but we will see you again tomorrow. Till then, goodbye.